the 1840s, John Ruskin put art, man and nature together and out of the impact he drew great moral lessons to redeem a corrupt civilization. The man who fires up Ruskin to become the guru of the age is the great landscape painter J.M.W. Turner. Turner paints nature, not just the look of the weather exploding into typhoons and storms with the sea roiling and the sky rippling, but the emotion of that experience. He paints the truth of nature. He paints nature's power. Turner exhibited every year at the Royal Academy. In his old age, critics began attacking his vagueness. Ruskin came in to defend him. A letter Ruskin wrote to a magazine complaining about bad reviews of Turner was the seed of Ruskin's five-volume work, Modern Painters. The first one came out in 1843, when Ruskin was 24, and immediately made him famous. Modern Painters is a description of art from the Middle Ages to modern times, with Turner at the centre. Rather than vague, Ruskin says, Turner is realistic. Turner's landscapes don't obey fake conventions found in Victorian academic art. They're the equivalent of not being well-mannered in society. They depict nature in an attacking, inspiring, challenging relationship with the modern mind. Today, we call that kind of thing romanticism. We forget what it really means. Turner sees the cracking skies, the great sunsets and sunrises. He sees the rush of wind and rain. He sees the rush of modern life. He sees steam and speed and railway trains, the new violent forces that science produces. He sees all this as equally exciting, equally emotional. What he feels within, a great shaking up of man, is what he sees out there. Ruskin was an artist himself, but he didn't consider his own stuff art in the same way as Turner's was. Ruskin went to the same alpine passes that Turner went to and painted the same scenes himself. But the pictures are nothing like each other. Turner's a dramatic, vast, powerfully emotional, rolling explosions of mists and rocks, while Ruskin's are just some rocks. This is by Ruskin. He records what he sees. This is by Turner. He transforms what he sees. They're both exactly the same mountain location. Turner travels out there. He lives the reality. He understands the structure of rocks. He knows what cloud formations are, what the weather does, how nature operates. And he comprehends all of that with his own natural feeling. And the final painting is all of that. In the late stages of his art, Turner has gone on to a new level, elemental, powerful, sublime. But the audience doesn't get it. Victorian polite society doesn't see the truth in his late style, but smeary landscapes done by someone they think of as a social primitive. It's Ruskin who rescues Turner's reputation. Everybody thought Turner was a git. He is an incredibly annoying guy as far as communicating goes. He mumbles, he sneers, he gets in strops, he walks out of meetings. He won't account for himself. No wonder the public wants to cut him down to size even though he's only five feet tall. He's too suddenly rich, too suddenly established, too suddenly successful, and he's too enormously ineffable in his mist exploring. He's only the son of a barber. He's too working class to be sublime. For Ruskin, Turner's mental processes are the same as his own. Turner paints as Ruskin thinks, art as revelation, like God's revelations. Ruskin owned a painting by Turner of a slave ship in a storm, given to him by his father. It transfixed Ruskin. He saw in it God's salvation, man's cruelty. He saw the scale of nature versus the vulnerability of humanity. By expressing all this with such intensity, Turner reveals art's inner purpose. Art is not just 
a trivial enhancement of life that you talk about in a stilted, false way to impress people. It's about something tremendous that can and absolutely should change your life. Ruskin saw that in this painting, Turner's mists shower us with the mighty realization of our presence here on Earth. The laws of how to live come tumbling out of Ruskin like a new Ten Commandments, with Turner's art as God up the mountain. In modern painters, Ruskin proposes what he calls the law of help. In a plant, he writes, the taking away of one part injures the rest. If any part enters into a state in which it no more assists the rest and has thus become helpless, we call it dead. The power which causes the several parts of the plant to help each other, we call life. Ruskin goes on to say, the intensity of life is also intensity of helpfulness, the completeness of depending of each part on all the rest. The ceasing of this help is what we call corruption. Ruskin sees this law he's worked out as no place in the industrial mechanized world. Unless we remedy that, he thinks, we are lost. Eighteen fifty two, Ruskin, aged thirty three, floats through the Renaissance city of Venice, looking at history, coming up with answers to the problem of how to re civilize modern man. But it's not the message you might think. Ruskin is important because he creates great moral myths of what happened to the world, where it's headed and how people ought to behave. They're like biblical myths, only instead of biblical stories, Ruskin uses art and nature as his materials. Ruskin's greatest myth was created here in the city of Venice. Ruskin's here to write his next great book after modern painters. It's called The Stones of Venice. Instead of painting, it's about architecture. He prepares material for it, notes and drawings. He obsessively replicates every part of the city that interests him. His work is looking, analyzing, understanding. What architecture does, Ruskin thinks, is it expresses the values of a civilization. It expresses its soul. You can see the spiritual health of a civilization in its architecture. But when the civilization goes wrong, you can see that too. And civilization going wrong is what Ruskin sees in the Renaissance. Ruskin is the guy who comes up with the radical idea of a bad Renaissance instead of a good one. He sees the Renaissance as the first step toward the alienated, spiritually empty world of today. Ruskin says, Renaissance bad, the Gothic good. <laughs> 